Welcome back to This Week in Global Health, otherwise known as TWIG. TWIG is a weekly live Global Health News Roundup. Uh, we've got some exciting things to talk about tonight. We're going to be talking about malaria. We're going to talk about One Health. We're also going to talk about One Health and malaria. So that's <laughs> the, the three separate things there. Uh, we're also going to talk about some, some jobs and consulting opportunities that you might be interested in. So stay tuned. Uh, we've got an interesting team here today. You're going to notice that Jessica has apparently done something interesting with her eyeshadow or eye makeup. So, you know, watch this <laughs> eyeliner, space. Right. Eyeliner. <laughs> eyeliner. I mean, what do I know? Uh, Chris is learning to speak Russian. So if she uh, goes off on a, on a tangent in another language, that's what's happening there. And we've got a new member to the team, Sanskriti, and she's going to tell us some interesting things about One Health. Anyway, just a quick reminder, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, Remember, you can make comments in the comment section below the video, and we will respond to that. So let's start up a conversation. We want to hear what you think, and we'll respond to those those comments. We're excited to hear about what your thoughts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Also, of course, you might be listening to this on a podcast. Welcome to you. Um, and we've got a newsletter that we send out. So if you go to our webpage, www.twig.org, T-W-I-G-H, that's how we spell Twig, you can sign up to our newsletter and you'll get updates and, and alerts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In the description section below this video on YouTube, there will be links to any of the web pages that we talk about during the discussion. Okay, so that's it from me. We're going to jump right in and ask, Sulzan, would you talk to us about malaria? You've got a news item on malaria. Definitely, Greg. And since you forgot to introduce me, I will introduce myself. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Susan here. So on the occasion of the ninth annual Malaria Day in the Americas, which was on 6th November, there is increasing push to for governments and donors to focus on pushing this disease out of the Americas once and for all. In fact, in the last 13 years, because of scale-up interventions, malaria-related deaths in Latin America have gone down by nearly 78%. So it's time we kept the momentum going. Yeah, and very interestingly, along that same line, just talking about uh, the decreased rate of malaria incidence, the rate of new cases fell by 37% between 2000 and 2015, and that is globally. Now, in the same uh, period, malaria death rates fell 60% globally or amongst all age groups. One of the countries where we're seeing sort of the greatest uh, success in this is in Argentina, which is a little bit on what our article from Global Health Now focuses on. It's uh, really interesting you mention Argentina, Chris, because although malaria deaths worldwide have gone down, um, we have to remember that there is a disproportionate burden of malaria deaths in Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. In fact, nearly 90% of 198 million cases of the, uh, worldwide occur in uh, Africa. And 91% of all malaria deaths occur in Africa as well. So as we think of that, it's also important to think what's been happening there recently in terms of the Ebola outbreak. Um, as we all know, Sierra Leone recently became uh, Ebola free, but because of Ebola, actually the malaria deaths in the region have gone up drastically. And we're going to maybe see a change um, in the malaria deaths worldwide. Susan, just a quick question on that particular point. Um, you know, during during the crisis in West Africa, I, I think a lot of us suspected that there would be a lot of there would be an increase in deaths from from diseases like malaria. Of course, people with malaria present with a fever. People with fevers during the Ebola crisis may have been reluctant to uh, to present themselves to clinics, or the clinics simply didn't exist anymore. Had been taken over by the crisis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do we have at this point in time? And, and the answer might be no. Uh, do we have any sense of the extent to which deaths from malaria? Uh, increased during the last few months or you know the this extended period of time during which there's been an Ebola outbreak in West Africa so we don't have the exact numbers yet but there was a Lancet report which talked about uh, how malaria deaths have increased in Guinea um, also in my research I found uh, because 50 percent of uh, patients um, stopped going to uh, the hospitals because of the fear of getting Ebola but also a lot of hospitals started turning away patients so if you had fever and you went into a hospital that you would be turned away to go to the Ebola quarantine center it did not mm -hmm. matter if you had malaria or not so that has led to a drastic increase we don't have the exact numbers yet I'm sure very soon we'll have those Chris, you had a comment. 
Oh, I was just going to say, I was wondering if, and you pretty much already answered it, and I think a lot is still to be determined, sort of going back and looking and doing an analysis of what's been going on in the country, you know, but could we say that more malaria deaths were due to either misdiagnosis or the fear that was going surrounding Ebola, or if it was almost uh, the diversion of maybe funds and resources because Ebola was obviously this this pressing epidemic, um, you know, was it that people were sort of shuttling the money in a different direction, uh, or was it more the diagnostic side of it? So sort of an interesting point to think about, and I'm sure we'll learn much more in the coming months and years. Definitely. And can I quickly say it's actually both in the mm -hmm. region, diversion Absolutely. of funds as well as um, people turning away from health facilities. Yeah. Okay, a couple of little uh, fun facts about malaria, well, not so fun, just less than 200 million cases, uh, uh, there's just less than 200 million cases of malaria each year. Actually, as I was looking at that number, I kind of had to stop because I thought, is, is it really that much? And it actually is. Um, I think in, in 2013, if I remember correctly, there was 198 million cases of wow. malaria that uh, reported to the WHO. So it's, you know, we, malaria is, is and that that is at the end of the 37% fall since 2000. Right, so I mean, I don't know what the figures were in 2000, but they must have been significantly more than that. But anyway, it's good to see that there's a downward trajectory, and hopefully that will continue. Um, we have about half a million deaths a year, so malaria is still killing people, and uh, obviously, so we, we need to we need to ramp up um, access to to uh, diagnostics and treatment. Um, and about half the world's population live in an area that they are at risk of malaria. Right, so that's one in two people globally live with the threat of malaria dangling over their heads. Um, anyone on the team got any additional comments on malaria or should we move on? Uh, Greg, I do. I was just going to say, I mean, I think that what's what's really fantastic about this article is that it's it just shows that progress is getting made um, towards malaria elimination, which has been there's a lot of terms going on. People talk about malaria eradication or malaria elimination, malaria control, but I think they're showing that we are making progress towards a malaria elimination. It's happening in the Americas, and I think in a in especially in global health, when we set so many ambitious goals, um, and a lot of them are really difficult to attain. I think it's it's really important to show where we are making progress, and we are actually um, we are reaching these goals that we've set. And so it's kind of I think that's really optimistic for the field and shows that we can do it. Right. Thanks very much. Okay. So that's interesting stuff, and. Because malaria is so important, we obviously we're going to come back to this again and again and again. So uh, so watch this space. Now we're going to talk about something called One Health. This is an idea that I didn't know about much about until quite recently. It was actually introduced to me by the members of the team here. Uh, Sanskriti, can you give us uh, a little bit of uh, the One Health story? Hit us. Over to you. Um, yes. Yeah, so well, first of all, hi guys. <laughs> it's really great to be here. Um, it's my first time, so forgive me if I'm a little. Rocky at the start. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, how Vietnam mastered infectious disease control using the One Health strategy. So um, I don't know, for those of you who aren't familiar with um, the concept of One Health, it's a system of thinking where we recognize that our health is determined by the health of the, anim the health of animals in the environment. Um, and through interdisciplinary collaboration and communication between physicians, ecologists, and veterinarians, um, it aims to um, prevent disease spread before they become epidemics. So it's a really interesting concept. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I mean, I was just thinking about the fact that in my lifetime, right, so since I was born, uh, We've seen HIV, Ebola, SARS, MERS-CoV, swine flu, and probably other novel zoonotic infections affect people globally, um, which are, and it's really been so. The, so a zoonotic infection, if you're not familiar with it, is, is an infection that's something that affects humans, but where the host, where the virus usually lives, uh, is is in fact an animal, and um, and so we've and so that's I think I think we're looking at probably a novel zoonotic infection every five to ten years. Mm -hmm. uh, just looking at the, at the little list that I've given you there, and that's not a comprehensive list, which means that in the balance of my life, you know, presuming I live a nice, healthy, long life, you know, there's likely to be another five or six or seven novel zoonotic infections that affect the global community um, and, you know, and threaten our health. So you know, this, this is just to kind of bolster the idea that One Health is extremely important. 
Well, and, and one thing, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, 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 go on. <laughs> I was oh, actually just going to add to that um, yeah. by saying that, you know, even though this concept has actually been around for a really long time, it, um, it was actually really difficult to garner public support and public interest in this whole idea of um, nipping the disease in the bud pretty much by recognizing the different factors that are involved in disease spread. So, um, like you said, several diseases have kind of come about through this animal-human um, transmission, but, um, you know, recently there have been strides through the One Health Initiative and through One Health programs to actually um, to curb that. So it's a really interesting idea. Yeah, and one of the, the great things about the article that you mentioned uh, is that it, it highlights how that early action can really help you make strides that Vietnam after the first avian flu like the big one in 2003 went towards One Health as being one of its preventative methods and measures um, and has really accomplished a lot and then also just to build on that too um, Reasons to check out this article include the fact that it was written by Joanne Silberner, who has worked with the Pulitzer Center and was actually a guest on our Global Health and Journalism show. So she's got a lot of amazing and award-winning work on everything from NCDs to now the One Health movement. So be sure to check that out. Okay, and just a quick, uh, just a quick reminder that if you're interested in what we're talking about, there will be a link to this article in the description below the YouTube video. So click on the link, go and read the article, you'll learn a lot. Um, uh, Susan, you had a comment? I did. So um, when you think of One Health, it's really important that we don't look at dis human diseases in vertical pillars. Everything is everything has a downstream effect. There's deforestation, you know, that causes a um, lot of animals to lose their habitat. You know, they become stressed. The bugs they already have, their, suppose if they have a virus, the viral count goes up and they become more infectious. So it's really important to see these things together and look at the big picture and that's what One Health is. Yeah. Um, and just to add to that again, um, the CDC has actually recognized um, that there are, you know, it become, it, that it's becoming more and more important to, to follow this One Health strategy um, because, you know, human populations are growing and because, because they're growing, um, more people tend to live in close quarters with, with animals and this allows the diseases to spread between between these species. Um, the other issue is climate change and climate change results in disrupted habitats and um, that provides new opportunities for diseases to pass from humans to animals and between animals and animals. Um, and also international travel and trade have increased so diseases spread a lot quicker than you, they used to a couple of years ago. Okay, now we've had Susan talk about malaria, we've had Sanskriti talk about One Health, and now I'm going to get Jessica to tie it all together with a stroke of genius. Uh, <laughs> she's found an article that brings all of these concepts together, um, and when she's finished, uh, what we're going to ask Chris to do is translate all of that into Russian for us as a demonstration <laughs> of what she's learned in Russian. So first of all, do, over to Jessica. I can do one thing in Russian, and that is order food, so you're out of luck. Sorry, go That's Jessica. <laughs> um, well, they're actually not articles, but it is new research that's just come out of the most recent uh, American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene meeting. So I don't think it's been published yet, but it's been presented. Uh, but yeah, so with malaria, and we're talking about malaria elimination. So how do we get there? Well, one of the ways that we get there is with new tools. So that can be new tools that like brand new, new drugs, or it can be using existing tools in a different way, innovation. So one of the things that was presented at the recent meeting was using ivermectin for um, malaria control. Now ivermectin is a drug that's used for treating helmet infections, worm infections. And in a lot of places it's mass distributed freely. So there's already programs going on. Now evidence from um, observations in the field and in the lab have shown that this drug actually kills mosquitoes. So researchers were kind of thinking, well can we use this for malaria control? And so they did a, a randomized study in Burkina Faso. Basically, they just went into villages where there was already these programs going on, and then some of the villages got extra ivermectin during the rainy season. So 75% of villagers were treated, which then led to a 16% reduction of malaria episodes in children. However, children weren't treated specifically. So it really shows you that you know using this drug for a worm infection kills off mosquitoes and then reduces malaria. Now, going back to the One Health concept and a more holistic way of thinking about health, uh, and this is including thinking about how we use animals and the environment and, and how they're connected to our own health. Well, 
we want to kill off mosquitoes, right? But do we have enough of the drug in humans um, in order to kill off the, the existing mosquito populations? So researchers kind of came up with this idea of thinking, mm, we may not have enough humans to treat, but what if we give pigs or other livestock the drug so they get bitten by mosquitoes and then, then they're killing off mosquitoes? So there was a presentation at ASTMH where they showed um, that it's actually safe to give pigs a, a skin implanted silicone rod that releases a drug over time and that totally works so or at least in the sense it's safe so here's another new tool that we could go forward with using its for malaria control and it, it uses the one health approach which is to me super exciting sorry guys That's... I think I, like, I just got really excited we're talking about malaria <laughs> and one health at the same time that's a lot for today on a Sunday afternoon my afternoon definitely well, Jess I'm glad really. you mentioned about ivermectin because um, artemisinin is actually, you're, they're seeing evidence of drug resistance developing for artemisinin which has mm -hmm. been used to treat plasmodium falciparum uh, recently and in Southeast Asia they're seeing drug resistance develop so it's fantastic you mentioned that and very quickly um, I'd like to mention that for malaria this year was a big year because Nobel Prize this year went to UU2 and uh, William Campbell for discovery of artemisinin and ivermectin, so yep. big win. I know, awesome, right? Yeah. Yeah, very exciting stuff. And I must say, when you mentioned the story about ivermectin, uh, it's a nice old drug that's nice and cheap, yeah. if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, so you know, it's 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 a lovely kind of uh, reusing something that we've already got in our arsenal. It's not going to cost much money, and and it can it can have a significant impact. Mm -hmm. uh, Sanskriti, you had a comment. Um. Yeah, I was uh, I was actually just going to say that. Um, you know that in addition to just drugs there are much simpler methods as well to kind of prevent the spread of diseases in the in that article in Vietnam what they did was a lot of the markets they um, they made they made concrete um, floors that were easier to clean and they also um, put the cages that the animal that the poultry was in on elevations so that they didn't have to go one on top of the other and you know really just simple methods like that um, um, can be can prevent the spread of disease and the One Health Initiative does that and it also educates people on on better hygiene in terms of um, in terms of disease spread. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, I'm actually going to suggest, I know there's other things that people want to say about this, I'm going to suggest that we move on just for the sake of time. Uh, Chris, you've prepared some information about jobs and job opportunities that people that are watching this might be interested in. Uh, can you tell us about that? Do it in English first if you want. We'll have a little Russian translation. Or even just talk to us about food in Russian. We won't know any better. Chris, <laughs> over to you. I'm going to pass on everything except presenting the jobs. Um, I'm going to keep it nice and sweet because I know we are getting towards the end of our time for this evening. Um, just so you know, you can head over to twig.org and on our website, Katie is not with us right now. Uh, she'll be back eventually. So I'm doing Katie's Career Corner. We've got two postings for today. The first one is for Village Health Works. It's based out of Burundi and they're looking for a maternal, newborn and child health person, uh, actually grant launch coordinator specifically and they're accepting applications for that job through the 13th of November which is next Friday. So head on over to our website, you can get the email jobs at villagehealthworks.org and also view the entire job description and proposal uh, on their Google Doc. Next up is something for all of our global health tech friends out there. It's Voto. It's a Ghana-born, globally expanding tech startup and social enterprise. And they have uh, offices all around the world in Accra, Dakar, Mumbai, Nairobi, and Washington, D.C. And they're actually posting for about six positions for everything from insights and marketing to system op systems operations uh, and development directors. So you can check them out at votomobile.org and also the link to apply and all of the required materials uh, is on the website as I mentioned earlier. So be sure to check those out. We did sort of a broad range, not even remotely related to any of the things we discussed today. Okay, thanks very much, Chris. Okay, just a quick note, if you're out there and you're watching this, uh, firstly, if you're interested in either of those job uh, opportunities, we will have links to them on our webpage and in the description on YouTube below the video. But what I just want to quickly say is that if you're watching this and you work for an organization, in actual fact, you've got a job that you'd like us to highlight, please get in touch with us. Uh, you can do that at our webpage, twig.org, or you can email us at hello at twig.org, T-W-I-G-H. Uh, let us know about any jobs or consulting opportunities that are out there that you think might be of interest to our audience, and we will try and help promote those and get the news out there. Okay, I think that's all from us. 
Um, until next week, same time, same place. Don't ever change. Don't do drugs. Always do your best, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.